Greetings and welcome to Jeffrey Films. This 1990 Japanese American sci fi was Richard C. Serafian's last movie that he directed, and he was directing since 1962. It's also got Tim Matheson recently from Child's Play, the legend Charlton Heston, and Annabelle Schofield, probably one of her bigger roles. So let's review Solar Crisis. This movie starts out with an opening scroll. The sun's gone bad and it's cooking the earth. And then we jump to New Trinity, which is an asteroid space station where they're building a bomb with an AI. Its name is Freddy, and it talks to Captain Steve Kelsall. And thank you, Captain. Thank you for what? For always listening to me and taking me seriously. Sometimes I feel that everyone has grown tired of my constant complaints. Hell, they only listen to me because I outrank them. Freddy's being put on a cargo ship, the Chicago, and then we jump to Skytown. With a little bit more scrolling explanation, we find out that it's a military scientific space station. The USS Helios arrives, and it will soon begin its journey towards the sun. Introduce Dorian Hardware, who plays Captain Borg, and then we get some amazing techno babble. So the plan is to put Freddy the bomb on the Rob probe and launch him into the sun, but it's going to need a human pilot. Really guys? Bomb into the sun? That's never been done. Then we jump to the IXL headquarters in Vegas where people in boardrooms argue we learn that Starfire theory is certain. A mega flare explosion will vaporize the Earth's atmosphere and destroy all life. Their scientist Dr. Haas recommends supporting the Helios project, but the corporate answer is nah, we'll be fine, and they want to board the raw expedition. Back on Skytown, Bobby does not have flirt appropriately and he just picks up Alex and hugs her. And then Steve Kelso shows up and Alex introduces herself. She has a lovely accent. Every system has been monitored and personally verified. Now my procedure will include all personnel, both physically and psychologically. Psychologically? Well, a psychological study of the ship's personnel under stress conditions will prove very beneficial. Lady, that's nonsense. Steve then visits his dad, goddamn legendary Charlton Heston. They argue because Steve's always trying to prove himself to be more than just an admiral's son, but he loves his dad. Borg addresses the crew, telling them the flare's destructive power, and then Alex gives them some dirty talk. This is the region we need to penetrate, region 17. This is where we will prematurely trigger the flare on the far side of the sun. Steve, now taking command of the Helios, tells them the original plan, but that they have to save time. That's why Freddy's on in Chicago and they're going to rendezvous with him before taking him towards the sun. Also, that someone's going to have to pilot the probe. Hey guys, by the way, uh, one of you's going to die. Steve's son in the academy apparently stole a plane and crashed it into the desert. He finds a very churchy outpost where he meets Crazy Jack Pallets. Are you shipping me? <laughs> oh, I knew it! I knew this kick ass! I knew it! <laughs> he talks to him, he wants to get to Skytown to see his dad, wants to go to the Red Sand to take the shuttle up. Alice gives Steve a list of five names of people that can pilot the Raw. She's on that list, and so is he. The Raw arrives, but there's some tense moments as to they almost lose it. Charlton takes a dropship down to find his grandson. I mean, he's an admiral, he can do what the hell he wants. Jack and the kid are down there on the road and they get a flat tire, and the automated trucks won't stop for them. But Jack has a theory. If he stands in front of them, his human matter will actually program the truck to stop. I mean, at some point, you just gotta test the theory. And he's not wrong. We learned that Alex is a test tube baby. She doesn't know her parents. She's biogenetically engineered, both mental and physical. Steve looks her up. Creepy white haired dude sneaks into her room when she's showering, steam based, knocks her out with tech and uses a machine on her eye. But to what end? He calls Claire on the ground and says Mr. T can play her like a piano and that he's the only one that can undo what he did. The next she's up and back to work, but really struggling and the crew notices something's wrong with her, but they ignore it. Maybe if they didn't. Dr. Haas pleads with Teague not to screw over the Helios mission, so Teague strands him in the desert. Jack and the kid are in the back of the truck, and it gets pirated and they get shot at, but when they open the door, they recognize him. He's Colonel Travis, a friend. Hey, would you look at that? It's old Travis! Hey, Colonel! What in the hell are you doing in there? Bork tells Steve about the latest problem. It's pretty bad, and Alex is back to work with no medical checkup. The captain has to pick Lieutenant Steve Meeks to go out and solve the problem. It's a suicide mission. They don't even know what caused the problem. My guess? It's sabotage. Meeks' medical readings are approaching terminal and everybody watches as he tries to fix the problem, but he's losing it mentally and then the explosion happens and he dies. Help me! Help me! 
The radiation levels calm down, returning to normal, and the captain recommends Meek for a Medal of Honor. I mean, he didn't even really succeed. The explosion still happened. I thought he was supposed to stop that. Alex is having flashbacks of her attack and she can't make any sense of it. She's pretty upset. Down on the planet, Charlton is down there looking for his grandson and he's proven why he's the best fucking actor ever to exist. My son's flying into that inferno, that bloody suicide mission. I, I could have ordered him off that. I could have, but I didn't. Now maybe I lost them both. Freddy attaches to the Helios. Now they have the bomb. The Sampires find Dr. Haas and they give him water, and then they take him to the Oasis bar. I mean, they're actually pretty nice Sampires, I gotta say. And he talks to the kid and he tells him Teague's plan. And then we find out that Jack got him a ride to Red Sand. So, he sends him off. Vaya con Dios, friend. Where are you gonna go now? Oh. Some black suits arrive and investigate who Dr. Haas was talking to. And then they talk to Jack. Pretty much interrogate the shit out of him. And the kid in his ride gets spun out as the plane just flies right above them. And they get out and they snap the driver's neck. Jesus Christ! What, what's going on here? <laughs> Dr. Manawi talks to Freddy and Alex pops in and wants to borrow his card because hers isn't working. Manawi? Hi, Alex. Hi, Freddy. Hello, Alex. Listen, my computer card's all messed up. I don't know what's wrong with it. Do you mind if I borrow yours? The Admiral shows up and finds out some corporate types were asking the same questions about the boy. And then some weird dude decides he's gonna mess with the Admiral. Evil corporate white-haired dude is questioning Travis, and then he drags him to the kid. His face is really swollen from a beating. And then he dies. I want you to concentrate on living. Can you do that? Can you remember? Huh? Alex has more flashes of her attack, and then an oxygen tank blows, and an explosion hurts Borg and sends him to the med bay. He tells the captain that someone is sabotaging the ship. Now we see the kid is flying with Teague on his private jet, and he takes him to a beach and they're talking, and he leaves the kid there and sends his white-haired assassin to take care of him. But the kid runs off to the rocky area, and they have a little cat and mouse game, where he manages to get the gun from the white-haired assassin and shoot him. Eventually the Admiral shows up and grabs him. The captain keeps trying to call Skytown, but he can't get through. The communications are down. TC says she'd do anything to get it going. Come on, anything? I'd give these instruments a hand job if it would help me get through, but it won't. Back on the planet, the Admiral and the military have shown up to Teague's corporate residence, and they go there to arrest him, but he flies off in his plane. But they take care of that problem. Borg gets back to work on the aft thrusters. Also, there's a code coming through, Delilah. And the captain finds a security card. It's Nanami's. And Alex is having more flashes. I'm noticing the trend whenever Alex has flashes. Something terrible happens. Maybe nothing will happen this time. Nah. Now there's a manual detonation about to go off in six minutes. Nanami is talking to Freddy, trying to talk him down, but he won't listen to him. Then they find Nanami dead. And Alex is also unconscious, bleeding from the eye. They can't get back into the systems because there's some, and I quote, bullshit code that is blocking them from getting back in. And they need to get through. The bridge finally does get some access, but they need a voice code. There's 30 seconds of detonation, so they try to use the pre-taped voice of Alex, but the computer recognizes it's pre-taped. It's a pretty sophisticated computer. Alex wakes up just in time to cancel it. And then Freddy tells the captain that it was Alex that programmed him. He asks her why, and she says, I don't know why. They got inside my head. I couldn't stop them. I couldn't. The captain now realizing what he has to do says you should set up a rendezvous with the Chicago. They'll get you home. And then he threatens Alex. If this ship blows, at least I'll have the satisfaction of watching this come out by the roots. She tries to convince him that she can fly the raw. And then she Spider-Man kisses him. Alex gets onto the ship and now there's nothing they can do but hope that she's in control. She flies into the sun and we get some sweet special effects with some operatic music. She said she loved him. 
how they barely even communicated in this. They head home, the end, I guess the earth is saved? They kind of left that part out. When Solar Crisis began filming, it had a $30 million budget, but it quickly inflated the 43, which is crazy amount of money for this kind of film. Nip and Steel, one of the investors, announced a Japanese theme park based on the film, which probably never happened, and if it did, it didn't last long. Scientist Richard J. Taro served as a technical advisor for the film. He first tried to convince some filmmakers to avoid sending the crew to the sun, calling it unscientific. And then it was eventually explained to him the audience would demand such a plot point, regardless of scientific accuracy. So he realized his job was to make impossible situations sound more plausible. The movie was based on a novel and it didn't do very well, it wasn't received very well by critics other than its special effects, but it's actually an okay watch. And I really enjoyed Anna Sheffield's performance, you had Charlton Heston in there, Tim Matheson's a pretty solid actor, and Jack Palance is always entertaining to watch. She's gone, Steve. It's over and done. Take us home. So in the end, this is just a simple sci-fi with a decent side story in it. It's an entertaining watch, something you'd watch on a Sunday afternoon. You might even like it, but you're never gonna love it. You're not gonna go around telling people that you saw it. You're not gonna go recommending it to people. Unless you're me. Then you're gonna try and tell everybody about it. Well, as always, thanks for watching.